Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Hey, I'm really pleased to be interviewing a dear friend and colleague here today and a fellow veteran that continues to make the world a better place. We're going to be talking about action-focused leadership that's tackling some of the greatest issues of our day and our time. Unfortunately, that's human trafficking and modern slavery, uh, slavery, which unbelievably is on the rise here in 2022. But stay tuned for what promises to be an intriguing discussion, one that offers you different ways to take action to get in the fight against uh, trafficking and slavery. As we all know, global supply chains got um, a lot of heavy lifting to do and fortunately are taking action uh, in that regard. But with no for- further ado, I want to welcome in my dear friend and guest here today, Mary Kate Saliva, host of our Veteran Voices series here at Supply Chain Now. And trust me, so, so much more. Mary Kate, how you doing? Hey, Scott. Thank you for having me. It's great to be in the hot seat with you again. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. But that that's, come on, that seat is never hot. Uh, and you know, we're big fans of all the work you do. Uh, there's so much uh, yeah. apart from uh, what you do uh, during your, what I'll call day job, use that term loosely, all the servant leadership and the give forward and the do good stuff that you're up to. So we're big fans of the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta-based uh, Mary-Kate Saliva fan club. Um, I so, appreciate that. <laughs> Um, all right. So a lot of folks uh, are, will be familiar about um, you know some of your interviews here and some of the interviewing you do here, of course, through Veteran Voices and some other ventures. But let's refresh their memory a little bit. Tell us, Mary Kate, where did you grow up? And I'm going to ask you a, 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 a follow up question or two about your upbringing. Oh, yeah. See, now now the roles reversed here. Right. Um, but yeah, see, I um Well, actually, I. I grew up uh, as a Navy brat, so my dad was in the Navy, so we moved a little bit here and there, uh, but surprisingly Maine, uh, so jokingly say the population five, you know, my family and the dog, but, uh, you know, Maine's a very beautiful state, and I was fortunate enough to spend most of my upbringing there, so, um, but, you know, I do talk about Guam a whole lot, so definitely very much part of who I am as well as as a Chamorro woman, but, um, you know, I am also European descent. So I think that's the beauty of it, right? Scott is just, we're all melting pot of all here and there. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And you know, I forgot the main connection. I remember that coming out in our very first time, probably two years ago now that you and yeah. I sat down. Um, so I got to ask you, and, and it might be an obvious or a stupid question, but one of your favorite food dishes growing up in Maine? Oh, gosh. Well, I absolutely love lobster and I can't, you know, I can't beat the prices. I actually getting it like fresh off the docks from the lobstermen supporting local. That's one thing I love about Maine, too, is that they're very much about supporting local and getting it from the farmers and blueberries. You know, another big thing. We had a big apple festival in our town growing up and I just, you know, I'm a big fan of apples and uh, cooked in all different ways. (laughs) <laughs> baked in all different ways, all different things. And just, um, yeah, just getting it, having food, bringing the community together. was just amazing. There's actually Maine, um, up in Northern Maine, they just had the lobster festival. Okay. Up in, uh, in Katy national park, uh, up that area that way. Well, you know, so, so giant the- lobsters walking down the street, you know, <laughs> cheap giant lobsters. If I'm tracking with you. Um, so yeah, the lobster supply chain, uh, Maine plays a big role. The the blueberry supply chain, as you mentioned, lot some folks may oh, not know. Oh, syrup! How could I forget the maple syrup? I mean, yeah, March time frame, the sap houses getting fresh syrup from the sap house, putting it on a fresh bowl of ice cream. Okay, yeah. I've never had yeah, maple syrup on ice cream. I guess that's a thing, huh? <laughs> that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, I think mean, there's a lot of things that Maine makes a thing. So, yeah. <laughs> Looking All good, right. right? <laughs> so one final question, and then we're going to move into some of the uh, the good, great work you're doing. 
uh, in Maine. What, what did y'all do, uh, you know, for recreation? Yeah, you know, other than all the the, the food, uh, delicious culinary uh, ideas you just left with us. What what y'all do for fun? Where'd you go? Oh, actually, I loved. Uh, we love going down the river. Uh, my, my family we had a uh, canoes, and we go down the river and we go camping. Bring a friend that can play guitar. Bring a friend that can tell some stories. And it was just you know those are some of the best uh, childhood memories that I have. Is is just literally being outside. And I have to tell you, Scott, I went for a walk yesterday with my dog and I, there weren't, there wasn't a single person outside, like nobody, not a single kid on the playground. The playground was empty. And I was just amazed because when I was a kid, I just, you know, gather all the like little rascals from the neighborhood together and we would just go and have a good time, <laughs> go out to like the old abandoned buildings and yeah, just being on the river. Um, being out a, with nature. Yeah. yeah, a canoe. Man, I, I I would be so jealous as a kid. Uh, man, to, you know, my dad had a um uh, a boat for fishing, right? But of course, I, I didn't have access to that. Unless he was going, I could ride. And if I had a canoe to explore and kind of have my own vessel, man, my folks wouldn't see me for days. So you paint a, a picture that definitely, definitely resonates with me. Um, yeah, and okay. the old Pontiac my dad had. We used to go in the old in the parades with his old Pontiacs. So, really? Um, yeah, just from the '40s, and wave our little American flag out the window. Um, you know, just I think that's why I, I really miss. I feel like par- parades are so condensed nowadays. But I remember them going on longer, and just as a kid, it was just so fun and uh, antiquing. I'd say I don't know different parts of the country call it junking, thrifting, antiquing. <laughs> whatever they want to call yeah. it, yard sailing. And uh, yeah, big pastime of, of my family. So, yeah. Okay. So we're going to get your your uh, bargain picks on a future episode. Yeah, we we'll have an that. antique in 101 with Mary-Kate Saliva. That'd be fun. Um, well, I appreciate you sharing uh, and, and rekindling our, um, uh, refreshing our memory of uh, your upbringing uh, there in Maine. All sounds wonderful. Um, I want to shift gears here. Uh, so as we talked about on the, the front end, you know, one of the biggest issues of our time right now uh, is the travesty of human trafficking and modern slavery. Even for some, even if for some, it's kind of in their blind spot, right? Uh, we've had some big lessons learned over the last year or so, uh, partnering with a variety of groups to include Hope for Justice, a great nonprofit that I know you're yes. aware of. It's based uh, in the UK, but doing great work uh, globally. And, you know, again, I also mentioned on the front end, According to various reports and data, both trafficking and slavery are on the rise. That's just it's, it's heartbreaking. So, uh, what I love, one of the many things that we love about uh, uh, all of your passion and your work and um, your leadership is is you're not reading these reports. You're doing something about it, which I love. So, why why is this? Why is doing something about trafficking and modern slavery? Why is this so important to you? Um, yeah, it's a great question, Scott. So one of the things for me is I I don't claim to to be a subject matter expert um, by any means. And there's a lot of unspoken heroes out there doing a lot of great work. But how my personal story with it was actually about a, a decade ago uh, when I was a, a graduate student at the University of Guam. There was the first known human trafficking case in Guam. And I say first known uh, to emphasize that, you know, human trafficking has existed it's beginning of time, but it's one of those things where because of the law, there wasn't a law in place uh, at the, in Guam until 2009, a lot of the cases, potentially trafficking cases at the time, weren't recognized. Um, you know, it couldn't be prosecuted as such. And so there was a lot that I didn't know at the time. I didn't, human trafficking wasn't something I was taught in school about. Um, and, and it wasn't something that was a conversation, a point to worry about, I, you know, sexual assault, harassment, those were things that I remember even as a young teenage girl, you know, worrying about like people that might abduct me, unsolved mysteries kind of thing, white van going around, snatch up kids. But that's not the thing with modern day slavery or, you know, is what, you know, is human trafficking. And um, I was really upset about how the myths surrounding human trafficking at the time. And even though I didn't know a whole lot about it, I just heard a lot of um, myths going around amongst people in in the public about, oh, human trafficking is a problem that's just happening overseas. And, you know, it's, these are all, you know, foreigners. And, and that wasn't the case. They, right. they Sometimes there's a lot of time, there are a lot of survivors, you know, here in the U.S. too, that are Americans. They're born and raised, trafficked out of their own communities. 
And that's the thing with the word trafficking. It can be very misleading to think we're going across borders. So I decided that I wanted to do something and I rounded up about 40 university students at the University of Guam and we stood at the intersection of the main uh, road. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to say because we don't have highways in Guam, <laughs> Scott. Like fast as you go is like 35 miles an hour. But we're at the intersection <laughs> of Marine Corps Drive during rush hour because um, we wanted to we were holding up signs saying it's happening. We wanted people to ask us, well, what's happening? And to get that many student support, public support, we even had politicians come out and stand with us. We had some of the faculty come out and stand with us. And it was just great for people to just start the conversation. You know, what is this about? You know, what what's happening? And uh, it's not, you know, about fear mongering, trying to get everybody scared, but it's just to know that this is a serious issue. It, it threatens uh, security and you know it's it, there are people being enslaved and they come from all walks of life right so um uh and and the awareness is critical you know uh it's it is it goes under uh, the activity the illegal activity of trafficking and slavery in many in some cases takes place right up under our nose you, know, you mentioned in the here in the states I've, I've heard it um put that it's a 150 million dollar industry here in the states and that is i hate to put it in those terms but folks are profiting from ru you know ruining and, and wrecking lives from the victims of trafficking and slavery uh, and that figure probably is conservative because so much of it takes place under the radar right absolutely it's it's very lucrative and even the the, the definition of human trafficking you may see varied and um, the public and even the media still gets uh, smuggling mixed up with uh, trafficking, you know, whether it's in prostitution and talking about enticement and pandering. And these are some of the words that they're not necessarily talked about. They're not not necessarily common knowledge, but really encouraging folks to start that conversation. But you're absolutely right. Goes underreported. There's still a la lack of laws across the board, even in the United States. Uh, and resources available. Like we didn't have the first uh, male shelter, uh, shelter for male victims of trafficking until and I believe it was last year. Yep. Uh, so it's just a lot to be done. Um, I will add that the point of um, after I got into this advocacy work, Scott, as a volunteer, I learned uh, from my family about my grandmother's story, which I think I mentioned to you before about um, she wasn't taken in. Uh, but at the time during World War II, uh, they were known as comfort women, and there were uh, five known comfort houses on Guam mm. at the time. And um, it was to appease the Japanese soldiers at the time who were occupied the island. So uh, for the fact my great-grandmother hid my grandmother at the time, and to know I, I did a deeper dive on comfort women and, and sexual slavery then, and it still exists now. You mm. hear it now as modern-day slavery, but it's uh, under different names. Um, uh, it, it's just shocking. It really is. Uh, and, and your personal tie and your family's personal tie in is just, um, it's heartbreaking to, hear, to, to, to piece together what folks uh, had to go through or sadly here to here to this day are going through. Um, right. I'm going to come, I'm going to circle back to, um, your time in the U S army. I think you're still in the guard and reserves. I'm going to circle back to that. Are, is it the guard or the reserves that you still serve in Mary Kate? In, in the Army Reserves. Okay, Army Reserves. I'm going to circle back to that because I think as we stick with this human trafficking um, subject, you've got a big event that you're participating in soon. Yes. Uh, you serve as a veteran fellow with the Hoover Institution, which is, uh, I think, hosted by Stanford University, part of Stanford University's uh, programming. Um, tell us about what this institution does and tell us about this upcoming event. Yes, absolutely. And so the Hoover Institution, it's located, uh, as, as many would know it, in, on the Stanford University campus. But Hoover Institution is a, a think tank, and it's been around for a while. One of the things uh, that hasn't been around for a while is the Veteran Fellowship Program. And that was actually... So uh, Dr. Connelisa Rice is spearhead, uh, spearheading the program, and she's uh, head of the Hoover Institution right now. And she wanted to pick um, 10, 10 veterans, post 11 veterans. So out of a pool of applicants nationwide, uh, somehow I'm sitting here before you saying I'm a veteran fellow. Wow. But I'm 
truly grateful of the opportunity. And it was something that when I I saw the opportunity, I heard, heard about it through actually connection on, on LinkedIn, another veteran, and to hear about what they're looking for. Uh, she was looking for problems impacting like the American people. So it didn't have to have a tie with the military. I have, I have peers of mine that are doing incredible uh they have problem statements that are extremely relevant and they're doing incredible work to tackle those problems. And uh, I just specifically decided that mine was going to tackle, have a tie in with the US military. Um, but I'm excited to say that on uh, September 1st, I'm gonna be hosting as part of my capstone project for the fellowship, uh, hosting uh, the inaugural uh, human rights conference with the emphasis human trafficking on Guam and in the Pacific. So this conference is part of uh, in January earlier. So earlier this year in January, me and my best friend, Erica Anderson, we co-founded the Guam Human Rights Initiative. And she actually was out there at that intersection I mentioned earlier uh, about a decade ago, holding up our signs (laughs) as graduate students. And uh, now 10 years later, she's about to finish a PhD program out in Glasgow, Scotland, and, and I'm in a doctoral program now. So using utilizing the Hoover network, they're incredible, like prestigious fellows and and uh, amazing intelligent people, way smarter than me, Scott, uh, <sighs> are able to help me brainstorm and think about ways that I could really impact the community. So one of the things that was really important to us for this conference is that it's free. So we wanted to make it so unless you want continuing education units, it's just at a small fee, uh, $35. But other than that, it's completely free and we really want to start the conversation. It's going to be virtually broadcasted. We have the registration link available. And the day before on August 31st, we're going to have a webinar. So again, the webinar is going to be talking about uh, human trafficking from a a strategic standpoint. And uh, on the September 1st, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. tomorrow standard time, we'll be running four panels. But excited to say that the governor of Guam will be in attendance as well as many other uh, high name people in Ireland. Wow, making a, uh, a quite a splash, uh, and, and and I think this is the first event. Is this the first event uh, of its kind in in Guam? Is it related, I guess, related to the the Hoover Institution. Yes, for related with the Hoover with the Hoover Institution in partnership. That's why it's, I'm just so proud of of what we've been able to achieve in just a matter of a few months, Scott. I tell you, like literally just a few months ago, Eric and I were just talking. You know, let let's do this. Let's make this happen. And we definitely would not have been able to do it with you know without our sponsors, without the support. Um, even our our Rotary Club came together. The other Rotaries on island came together. Uh, the University of Guam, uh, you know, it's just really incredible. The victim advocacy groups like Guam Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Family Violence. Um, and what's so great is our keynote speaker, uh, attorney of, and former AG Attorney General Alicia Lipdiaco is our keynote speaker. And she was our keynote speaker a decade ago when we held a forum on human trafficking. Uh, again, as graduate students with our, our picket signs, uh, we wanted to host a forum and she was our keynote then. She has agreed to come back and it's just great to see where we're at now. Really that is, full circle. That is awesome. Uh, look forward to getting lots of key takeaways and uh, some of your experiences at this event. Um, so you mentioned the Guam Human Rights Initiative, which is a uh, nonprofit that you and Erica, I believe, uh, founded. Um, how can folks? You know, how can folks jump in and support and and get involved or or learn more information about that? Yeah, so we actually have a a website on guamhri.org. We kind of shrunk that down, Human Rights Initiative down to HRI. But um, ironically, we say our acronym um, is GRI, but we're, you know, adding team in there so we can say we got grit. Um, (laughs) You know, following your footsteps, Scott, of uh, cool slogans there. But um, (laughs) we have a LinkedIn as well that we really encourage folks to follow. So we're going to continue to update that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that what really helped us off the ground really was our University of Guam um, and the University of Guam Regional Center for Public Policy, uh, RCPP. Um, They really helped us get off the ground by 
you won't believe the sky. I feel like no, where else, what other university would do this? But they let us have access to some of their graduate students. They asked for volunteers from the, the Master of the Public Administration students, said who would like to be in a cohort with Mary Kate and Erica as advisors and tackle uh, human trafficking as the first, but you know, first of many, hopefully many of human rights issues impacting Guam and Micronesia uh, in the region. So they, we uh, have four graduate level students that we got to run through a cohort and um, finish out uh, two white papers with them. So that was a, incredible. That, <laughs> is, that is awesome. Uh, and I can only imagine how that, uh, along with other things, added to the momentum you have as uh, as uh, what I'll put as we're a startup, right? A startup nonprofit that is going to do big things, already is doing big things. So uh, guamhri.org, is that the website? Yes. And okay. I will add that we are... Um, we started Guam HRI, Guam Human Rights Initiative, because we identified with numerous stakeholders on island that there's a significant lack in research and data on human trafficking. And I'm and still to this day, I'm very wary of the numbers. And I learned a significant amount of those who are on the ground, victim advocacy groups, uh, law enforcement, et cetera, who are dealing this fight in this fight every day. And just hearing, like you said earlier, Scott, the numbers are so hard to come by. And there's many reasons for that. But Erica and I are really hoping to raise awareness about these different human rights issues through our research and using the skills that we're learning at the doctoral level to be able to do that. Um, I don't doubt it. You will. I've seen you in action. <laughs> uh, you uh, you run through walls and you more importantly, you have other folks ready to run through walls based on on, on the work that you do. So uh, thank you for sharing about Guam Human Rights Initiative here. Um and, you know, speaking, you know, obviously um, here at Supply Chain Now, I tell you, we are proud, very proud to have members of our family and our hosts that are making such a profound impact uh, in global industry. So thank you on that behalf. And on that related note, um, you know, whether it's the government, whether it is uh, global supply chain, business leaders, global industry, you name it, we're all trying in many ways to you know, find the data, to better quantify the problem. Of course, that's what so many of us do in supply chain first, right? Figure out what the problem is. Um, it was great to see the White House um, uh, and, and Congress get together and pass the Uyghur Force Labor Prevention Act, get that into law where, and we won't do it full justice here, but in a nutshell, it forces supply chain leaders to prove mm -hmm that uh, raw materials and supplies and components don't come out of certain regions in China where, um, according to the um, various governmental agencies and other third parties, credible third parties, there's a lot of forced labor, slave labor going on. So uh, it's good. And I think hopefully that will be um, a step to be followed by many other steps, effective steps that will help us eliminate um, trafficking human slavery, forced labor, you name it, uh, around the world. Because the, the important note, I think, to make, Mary-Kate, something you mentioned earlier, it's not just in one location or region. It's unfortunately, it's everywhere. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So uh, also, you're tying this back to our global supply chain listenership here. Um, so you uh, are part and work with uh, a dynamic group called PMI, the Project Management Institute. And, um, you know, there's, if there's been, uh, there's been a whole slew uh, of, of trends and dynamics and uh, things that are impacting global supply chain. But on the positive side, project management and the, the formal discipline there has really been um, uh, an area and a, um, uh, a tool that supply chain leaders lean on more and more in recent years. I mean, it's been around for a long time, been made an impact for a long time, but it's really, you yes. know, as we're trying to digest change, doing that within a project management framework has been a big, big area of uh, relief and, uh, um, and, and uh, impact. So tell us about PMI. What, what is PMI? Yes, and I'm I'm glad you asked that because I know um folks will see the letters PMP all over LinkedIn. 
uh, they're just as proud of PMP as they would, you know, it's right where an MBA or PhD would be in right. their headline, their title. Uh, PMI, I used to say we're like the mothership is what I call us, but uh, the Project Management Institute been around since 1969. Uh, but one of the things that I really love about the Project Management Institute, PMI, is um, that they align with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And a lot of the work, uh, we have what we call it PM Impact, uh, where we have staff members that are logging their hours for impact and what they're doing out in the community, out in the world, the global community. And I have colleagues that are from all different regions of the world. And so it's really cool to sit in on a call like we're doing now, Scott, and just be able to talk in the different accents just on one call. And uh, I can and only just imagine. Being able to say, <laughs> and I can only imagine. But you know, being able to, and they're just, they really are about change and making positive change, a positive impact in this world. And to do that and being part of a, a team. Um, and, and we within the company, we have smaller regional teams. And it's just really great to be able to work across the aisle and work with one another, collaborate ideas, see if what's going on in one place can work over here. And it's just really amazing. Mm. And um, part of your role there is uh, reaching out to, to members of our fellow veteran community and helping them find resources because... Uh, all those certifications and the body of knowledge and and knowing how to um, you know accumulate and demonstrate your project management skills those are wonderful um, ways to help get a good job and advance in that career right absolutely and we're all about um, and I would say that PMI is is actually a non nonprofit so uh, we are um, pushing like upskilling helping to support folks in their career journey. And that's what I talk to people all the time from with all different industries is that project management applies across the spectrum of so many different industries. And we're with you every step of the way. We have resources available for all different types of learners. And in my role, since I, I am a veteran, I have the privilege of being able to work with the military veteran community uh, by spearheading the military and veteran initiative for North America. So that includes the U military as well as our, the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, our friends up to the north. And so being able to, to do that, hear their stories, hear where they're at. And I say PMI, being with PMI is being on a journey. You know, if you're at the very early stages, you don't know anything about project management, we have a course for you. If you're a mid-level manager and you're just trying to, you know, you want to get that next step, we have a, a course for you. So, you know, we have instructor-led training. We have self-paced courses, e-learnings. So many different options available. And that is what I did not know when I was on active duty. <laughs> I was like, where was PMI? <laughs> but PMI has always been there. And um, that's where we're at. We want to be able to engage. And for me specifically, um, talk to my brothers and sisters at arms that are still serving. Say, hey, don't wait till you're in your transition window. Don't wait till that last 12 months to start cramming in certifications. You know, start early. Use these now. You can... Benefit your it'll benefit your unit, benefit the organization for you to start soon. Uh, so well said. Uh, and I was same way. You know, when I when I transitioned in two thousand and two, I had the, one of the largest blind spots known to uh, modern history. <laughs> I mean, there's so much I had no clue about, uh, including yeah. great resources like PMI, you know, like Vets Two Industry, which we're all big fans of. Um, so y'all check that out. Uh, what if you're a veteran listening? Check out a uh, great resource, great community to get involved in. Uh, if you're uh, a supply chain practitioner, supply chain leader, looking to, to bring resources to your team to help digest change and and drive improvement and and navigate the global global obstacle course that is uh, uh, supply chain uh, these days. Hey, check Absolutely. out PMI. You um, can start and get a 45 minute uh, free course called Kickoff that we have. It's called Kickoff. It's free, and you get a cool digital badge that you can brag about on LinkedIn. Okay. You want to post it on social media, but yeah, it's only four or five minutes of your time. Some finish, uh, some smarter than me finish faster than that. But you can, uh, <laughs> it's the intro, and you can download different uh, documents there, uh, re different tools for your toolkit, and get an intro to project management. Love it. Uh, love it. Um, I don't know how you get any sleep at night. Okay. Because you got so much going on, you're doing so much good stuff. So we've talked about uh, the Hoover Institution, 
um, affiliated with Stanford University. I guess it's on campus there at Stanford. We've talked about uh, the Guam Human Rights Initiative. Uh, we've talked about PMI. Um, let's talk about, uh, so you're a U.S. Army veteran, and now you're serving in the reserves. Um, what has one, you know, if you think of one leadership lesson learned that your your time in service and in uniform has taught you, what would that be? Gosh, and um, I think one thing that it it's really has taught me is in leveraging the folks that I know. I don't want to take the camaraderie for granted. And you could probably, you may have about like the camaraderie being one of the top things that we miss, if not the top thing we miss about serving. And it's one of those things where we meet from people from all walks of life. And as a leader in the military, getting that opportunity to serve and, and lead and really bring people together uh, as part of a team. When we have missions going to all different parts of the world, I mean, it's the folks to your left, to your right, those who have your six. And I know I have a couch to bum on in probably every state in this country because I can just call up one. And the fact that we call each other brothers and sisters, you know, I think is is really meaningful. And that that's something that um, I probably took for granted too often earlier on in my career. And I wish I had leveraged it more to be able to learn from their mistakes, especially the veterans, mm-hmm. and to know that to stop being afraid. I think I I, help, I held myself back just from being scared about putting myself out there. It's a great time to be able to put, to step up to the plate and uh, lead. Yep. Uh, And we need it. A global industry needs it, needs real action-driven, values-driven leadership. Not not to be dramatic, but uh, for more now than ever since I've been alive. Um, And I would just also add, I think what you shared there, I think that's a great lesson for leaders in supply chain, in the private sector, wherever they are, right? How can you find ways um, uh, to create that camaraderie, those those meaningful relationships, you know, that sense of, um, you know, it's a work family, right? And yes. what else far beyond the, the function and, and uh, the job and the roles, you know, these are people. And that there's a lot more important going on stuff going on in their lives. And and as leaders, we gotta we gotta account for all of that, but make sure they're taken care of at, at home and at work in many ways. That was one of my lessons learned from uh being in the Air Force. You know, my managers, they they cared about what I did from, you know, uh at my duty station, right, in our analysis shop, but they also wanted to know what was going on at home in the dorm. Uh, over the weekends and, you know, made sure I was uh, taken care of. And certainly absolutely, uh, would love to see more of that, right? Absolutely. And I think about even just when probably different trainings, like even when you're at basic training or your tech school and the first thing when you meet somebody, you know, you might ask them, where did you go to basic or where are you from? But you you get that breadth of experience and that different number of answers. But Less so, I feel like on on this side of the the fence than um, when I was on active duty or even now in the reserves to be able to have that instant connection. Like I think Scott, like even our first conversation, you know, there's like immediate things that we can connect in. You know, I'm not as much of a sports fanatic uh, as you with <laughs> my bobbleheads, but uh, I did. <laughs> but you know, we were able to connect. You know, just from that veteran scent in our time in service, absolutely. And so, just. I think that's a beautiful thing, being able to connect with people on, on another level and to know that you went through the, what we call it, am I able to say the suck? <laughs> embrace the <laughs> suck, right? Not, not, nothing to bring people closer together than when you embrace the suck together. So um, there's a lot of truth to that. And, and uh, I think there's a lot of values that we can bring. Um, somebody brought up recently about the eating last. I, I heard from a civilian um, who added it to their talk and presentation about how they didn't know that that was a, a thing until they talked to a veteran um, and they asked about why this particular person, why they weren't getting in line and they wanted to make sure that everybody else ate, got to Mm -hmm. eat and there was enough food for them. And, you know, to us, I don't think we think as much of it, but for those leaders who do cut in front of the line, we know that we may not say anything, but we, we see that. And so, you know, that whole leading by example. Uh, Speaks, speaks volumes and impacts volumes. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, uh, you know, the, those folks that are willing uh, 
to not, it's not all about me. You know, it's not all about me and what I get and when I get it. I mean, you know, it, 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 it at leading by example and taking care of your team and making sure they're, t- you know, they've got what they need. Uh, it sounds simple probably to so many people, but man, to put it in action um, just impacts others around you in ways that you'll probably never appreciate long until long, a you know, long time after. Um, I want to, so, so Mary Kay, I want to paint this picture here as we start to kind of come down the home stretch with our, uh, our time with Mary Kate Saliva, uh, who leads the veteran voices uh, here at Supply Chain Out amongst many other things as we've talked about. Uh, so let's say you, you're the keynote at this massive conference where all of the uh, world's biggest supply chain leaders, chief supply chain officers, CEOs, you name it, are in a room and you've got their captive attention. What is one challenge that you would issue to them, Mary Kate? I would challenge them to, you know, with with human trafficking, as you mentioned earlier, Scott, the data, the lack of data. It's so important for our supply chain leaders to incorporate those data collection uh, systems to be able to to really take a closer look at that. Because when it comes to human trafficking, you'll find numerous incredible organizations out there here in the U.S. especially that are tracing the money. They're following the money. And And without us taking a proactive stance against human trafficking, modern day slavery, and taking a look at, especially with supply chain, uh, we're just letting, making it easier for the traffickers to stay in business. But we got to stop it at the root. And at the root, we, we find the root through following the money. So I think especially for supply chain leaders, we saw how significant, how important supply chain was during the pandemic, uh, the global pandemic. And this is a global problem. Human trafficking is a global issue and we need to step up to the plate. It's going to take an effort for all of us to not only, you don't have to have a degree, be a subject matter expert. You don't have to be a cop, a lawyer, social worker. You just need to have the interest, take the time to really do a deep dive in your current systems and your current data collection sources. What What is the data telling you about who you're buying from? And you should care about who your supplier, supplier, supplier is. That's right. Because um, you do, it's it, it's detrimental, right, Scott? Social media is so quick. People have information at the tip of their fingers. Your brand could go down the gutter in, in moments. If you know, would you should instead of finding out later, be proactive about it. So you're not one of those companies that's in the big headlines that the media is spurring around saying, you know, you're supporting. Trafficking and right. human trafficking, there's different types, labor trafficking, sex trafficking, but especially for supply chain and taking a look at that, it's going to take a global effort to to stop it. That's right. Uh, I'd say that's quite a challenge. I, I appreciate you uh, delivering that message. Uh, hopefully folks take heed. Um, you know, and as I've, I know I'm going to butcher this here because it's late in the day and my brain isn't working as much as it does early in the day. Uh, but I've heard it, heard our friend Tim Nelson with Hope for Justice put it. Um, yeah. Focus more on what are you going to do when you find it in your organization or your supply chain or in your e- whatever your ecosystem is. You know, it, it's it's um, you know we don't want to um, uh, villainize the folks that have no knowledge and then come across it. But right. that's when it matters, right? That's when it matters. What are Good people, good leaders. Uh, what are folks going to do when they see that it is part of their ecosystem? So that's the um, that's that's what makes it the big challenge of our time because it takes, to your point, it takes people to take action. To I mean, look, uh, let's face it. I mean, it's it's all lives are at stake, right? Lives yes. and forthcoming generations. So, um, so anyway, great. Appreciate your perspective there, Mary Kate. Uh, one final. That's a great perspective too. Um, I would say like you could sell, you know, you sell a human over and over again, whereas a weapon or a drug you can sell once. Um, and you may hear that in other talks too, but there's so much truth in that. And so it, um, you know, even for some of the messaging that we have, sometimes it, the victims themselves don't realize that they're a victim. It's not something, like I said, that we're taught in school. So right. even though the signs all point to trafficking, so even, you know, across the board, we instead of us waiting around for 
the uh, other entities uh, to do something, you know, we can be proactive, know what resources are available in your community to seek that help. That's right. So 100%, Scott, thank you. Yeah. You bet. Uh, I really appreciate your leadership on this area and 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 many other places. Uh, all right. So we mentioned veteran voices here. Uh, we usually drop a new episode every Friday. Mary Kate's been doing outstanding work. Uh, it's part of our uh, do good, give forward back um, uh, programming with our fellow veteran community, uplift their voice, yes. amplify their voices and their journeys. Love what you've been doing here. Uh, of course, we got to mention Vets to Industry. A powerful yes. nonprofit, a clearinghouse yeah. of great information for veterans, for military families, transitioning members, you name it. Uh, vets, the numeral two, industry.org. Y'all check that out. Um, what is a, a key takeaway or two that you, you know, amongst your favorites from your conversations uh, you've been leading at Veteran Voices? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I th that's a tough one. I know. And they're probably all listening too. But <laughs> <laughs> I will say that one thing that collectively, I believe across the board ha has been because every single one of them is serving with a purpose and they are serving beyond the uniform. That is what I really, you know, stemming from the great work that you started with Veteran Voices, Scott, about doing good and be the change that's needed. I've, I've that's what across the board they are all doing. And you wouldn't believe how many veterans I'm coming across that when I ask them what volunteer work you're doing, they're like, well, I did something like a decade ago. You know, there's so many that that aren't doing anything <laughs> and they serve. And, and I, but I hearing them in the episodes talk about how they were able to manage it, how the importance of serving beyond the uniform, I think is invaluable because it's not only helping them grow their networks and do good, but also obtaining additional skills outside of what they have from their their day to day job. So um, serving with a purpose and uh, knowing that they're not alone in doing so, if you don't know where to start, you can reach out to any of them that I've interviewed on the episode and I know that they would take the shirt off their back to help that person. So completely agree. Uh, and I'll, again, appreciate what you're doing there. Uh, we all I think as a, um, you know, certainly speaking at this from a, um, you know, not a United States perspective, right. As both having served in the U S armed forces, uh, you know, I think the veteran population makes up about 10% of the overall population, um, and as with that, there's so many uh, Americans that didn't serve that really there's a, they have a big blind spot when it comes to the veteran experience and what's involved right. there. And, and that's where I really love uh, the work you're doing is uh, that awareness piece that is so critical so that we can start to, in a very meaningful way, tackle and resolve uh, and fix some of the issues facing uh, our veterans and their families. So, Mary Kate. Thank you so much. I appreciate what you're doing. How can folks connect with the one and only, the one and only Mary Kate Saliva? This it takes a village sometimes, Scott. Um, but I, uh, they can definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, there's even a chat option at theguamitry.org that you can reach out and one of us will answer. But if you want to reach out to me directly, LinkedIn is a great platform to do that. And I welcome if you have suggestions, if you know a veteran who's serving beyond the uniform, please let me know. I would love to see uh, if they'd be a great fit, if I'm a great fit and, and Veteran Voice is a great platform to amplify the efforts that they're doing. Uh, so I really appreciate and thank you all for, for tuning in. And thank you so much, Scott, for having me today. You bet. Uh, I'm I, I'm tickled. I, I love being able to catch up with you. Hey, you're a real... Um, modest individuals. So I want to put this out there uh, for the Guam Human Rights Initiative. Folks, if you've got some uh, some charity dollars uh, here as we kind of move towards uh, uh, late uh, the fourth quarter of 2022, or if you want to support an organization that's really action-based, that's doing some of the things that Mary-Kate uh, has mentioned here, hey, look them up. They could use your funding. Uh, you know, they're doing great things and, and to do more great things, hey, it takes resources, right? So check out uh, yes. guamhri.org. And, uh, and and if you if you have any problems, come through us and uh, we'll make sure you get, uh, you're able to connect with Mary-Kate. So Mary-Kate Saliva, big thanks for what you're doing. Safe travels and your upcoming 
uh, big conference. And we look forward to getting a full report when you get back. I really appreciate that, Scott. And uh, wouldn't be here as host without you. So, I mean, just huge shout out to Supply Chain Now and what you all are doing. I mean, you, you branched out so many other hosts because of the it all stem and great work and really bridging that gap and bringing a bunch of great people together. So really love what you're doing and um, looking forward to connecting with other rock stars out there helping the global community. <laughs> you set a high <laughs> standard uh, of that rock star standard. But hey, uh, thanks so much, yes. Mary Kate. Uh, to our listeners, hey, thanks so much for for joining us in this journey. Right, thanks for tuning into Veteran Voices and and all of our different shows. Uh, I tell you, uh, Mary Kate Saliva is an inspiration, and you know, hopefully, you know, it's all about deeds, not words. And people like Mary Kate really, you know, we talked about being that role model. She's doing it right. So. With that said, I'm going to uh, finish our show like I always do, challenging all of our listeners on behalf of our team, hey, to be like Mary Kate, do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed, but take action, deeds, not words. And with all that said, we'll see you next time right back here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.